The theme going into 2022 for the case and its REM project was headwinds. NIMBYs were throwing project cripplers at the second eastern stage. COVID had delayed the opening of the first. Politicians watching the developing kerfuffle were trying to see how to capitalize on the situation. There's voters in them, burbs. The problem was, despite labeling the REM last a pet project of Quebec's premier, Francois Legault, political insiders knew an inconvenient truth about it. The case directing it had woven a well-balanced political masterpiece. Freak out! Everybody watch this! Look out! Hit him with the hat trick! The model of the case required the Quebec government to make a request for any project. The Liberal government had done just that in the first stage of a ramp struck out towards the liberal heartland of the West Island. But it also made a trip into the territory of their political opponents. The Der Mountain station would be heavily used by the CAQ voter base and make the project politically hard to cancel no matter who came into power. And indeed, there was a change of government. And far from cancelling it, the CAQ made its own request a transit solution for their own voter base in the east of Montreal. The case came back to them with a project called REM Last. Here's the REM East. Super East. The thing is, it's actually the REM North and East. The name lets the provincial government internalize it. All great, the REM East we asked for. But the project passes through eight ridings. Two of them are CAQ in the East, but three are Quebec Solidaire and three are Liberal. As of 2022, the whole REM project passes through 21 ridings, 15 Liberal, 3 CAQ, and 3 Quebec Solidaire. This means that although the Liberals and Quebec Solidaire want to stick it to the CAQ, no one was quite sure how to without ultimately screwing over their own voter base. At the municipal level, Project Montréal had run in 2017 on a transit platform that would connect Montreal North to the city centre with a new subway called the pink line. That plan was never really feasible and the mayor was initially pissed that the CAQ was granting Montreal East a connection without a thought for her pink line to Montreal North. But the political gift of her mayoralty landed in her lap when the case attached a branch to Montreal North in the project. This pink solution and the speed that the case are operating at actually suddenly makes it quite possible for the mayor to achieve this moonshot project and secure that legacy. But those slight headwinds became a proper storm that threatened to destabilize this relative peace in early 2022. A leaked, very negative 84-page internal report from a regional transit authority, the ARTM, came out in the press. A similar leak arrived the next day from Montreal's transit agency, the STM. At first, I assumed this was brinksmanship. There are legitimate issues with the REM, and maybe you have to hardball to get them sorted out. Near where I live, the REM will pass the major Berryukam interchange, but riders will probably have to walk a block from the station outside to then duck down and transfer to the metro. A new development is going in, which would be a great moment to build a connecting tunnel and spawn a second satellite underground city. But no one seems to be talking about it. Great place for a transit authority to spot an interconnection opportunity and work with various parties to improve the user experience. But that's not what this leak is about. Instead of focusing on the experience of users, they focused on the experience of themselves. A deep, organizational insecurity was exposed. So let's look at the crux of the problem. Imagine a nurse called Steve, who breaks gender norms and lives near the library in Point Altron. Good for you, Steve. His job at the McGill University Health Center means his daily commute starts when he leaves his home at 8.10 to walk to the 487 Express Bus to Henri Bougon, departing from the stop at 8.15. Steve arrives at the metro station at 8.41 and heads down the escalators with people from near and far. Buses from Montreal, the STM, and other regions all converge on that terminus station like a giant commuter catchment basin. The metro departs at 8.45 and arrives at Berryukam at 9.01. He then transfers to the Orange Line, arriving in time for work at 9.20. All in all, one hour and 10 minutes of travel. 
But things are gonna change for the better for Steve when the REM goes in. Steve will depart from home at 8.10 and walk to the new REM station, arriving at Centreville at 8.40, before transferring to the Orange Line and walking in the door at work at nine. All in all, 50 minutes of travel. So less time, less transfers, and less bus. The problem? Well, it's here. You didn't use our things, Steve. The ARTM and STM fear the loss of riders on their line and want Steve to have a longer commute so that their infrastructure gets used. But what's interesting is Steve does still end up swiping his card for the Metro at Centreville because the reality is most people don't work at Gare Centrale. They will go onwards. And if they're on the bus or the Metro, the existing transit authorities will be clipping their ticket. Additionally, this new line creates a network effect. Each new station added to the network makes all the other stations more useful to people. As a user, when the Montreal Rapid Transit Network more than doubles in length, people up and down every line are more likely to leave their cars at home. A person living in Laval next to the Orange Line now probably would drive to see Steve. But now, they'll probably be giving both the STM and CWQ some money. The report was filled with other strange gripes. One was that the bus network would need to be reconfigured, which is like complaining that you have to go to the door when the pizza gets delivered. Yes, when your rapid transit network gets the largest expansion in its history, you probably will be totally rethinking the buses that connect to it, which is actually an opportunity because remember our commuter basin? Well, when transit takes less time, more people use it and people go further distances. Many of the buses, like the one that took Steve to Henri Bougrand, will now be free to go on a hunt for more passengers, taking new, more direct and faster routes. Because the report brought this up, it makes me think that they haven't calculated the impact of changing all of their bus routes, which makes what they said next really odd. The report thinks, based on a 2013 study, which will be 20 years out of date when the line opens, that only 6% of REM last riders will be new transit users. So that number is, dare I say it, intentionally pessimistic because they can't possibly be that stupid. And even if it was accurate to 2013, it still wouldn't matter. Check out Brossard right now. The skyline is rapidly changing. Montreal is getting itself a little second downtown sort of deal. Large numbers of transit oriented residential units are going up and on each listing, they proudly state their proximity to the REM, which will whisk these new residents across town. As the REM gets underway, like Broussard, Laval, and if you reach way back in time, Longueuil before it, it will get its own density development boom. And luckily, we're in desperate need of housing. These former industrial sites in East Montreal are already in the process of being remediated and ready to house hundreds of thousands of new property taxpayers. The potential for low traffic numbers is the most solvable problem with the best solution I've come across while living in Montreal. How are we going to raise tax revenue when all we have is hundreds of hectares of undeveloped land next to a rapid transit line during a housing crisis? So with this laughable pessimism and cynical obstructiveness, what's going on here, ARTM? Are you okay? Oh no, you are not. In the Montreal Gazette a month prior to the leak, Alison Haynes remarked, CDPQ Infra is in the driver's seat, calling all the shots on two of the most costly, significant, and transformational transit projects in generations, while the ARTM has been relegated to a mere bystander. That's right guys, the ARTM is just watching, someone else having all the fun. The case has cucked the existing transit authorities and now they're having an existential crisis. And it's totally understandable, when you have a look at the document signed for the first REM, it outlines that the ARTM will be responsible for collecting fees and paying the 72 cents per passenger kilometer. And down at the bottom, you see the signatures of the various case people and the government. For the ARTM, it's a little bit like waking up one morning and finding out that your partner signed a lease for the place across the street. In your name, without asking you. Even if a place seems nice, what the fuck? So why did this happen? Well, these agencies haven't been getting results for residents. I mean, they're so fucking slow that it even took them 13 months to clumsily leak these hit pieces after the project was announced. I couldn't find a manila envelope. Oh, the STM guy, he has the envelope and it's, it's the pandemic and we couldn't find the envelopes. I think that the case and the government didn't want to have too many cooks in the kitchen, so they didn't invite them to that kitchen party. 
but here are the consequences of that choice. Now we have a very grumpy couple of chefs who are already stressed about the damage that the pandemic has done to their finances. And they really do sound like the person that you forget to invite to the party. The leak is just, it's probably gonna suck, it's probably gonna cost lots of money, no one's even gonna use it. Our transit agencies sound like people who hate transit. The job of these guys is to make transit better. Steve and his neighbors are choosing the RAM because it's a better experience. It gets them where they need to go faster and more easily. But the secret source of automation the case is using to keep those operating costs low and the service levels high aren't an easy option for the existing agencies. Times are changing. These manual systems, built around peak rush hour demand and a five day work week of commutes, are really out of date. The challenge of this new era has two potential solutions. You either do serious rethinking, lower your overheads with automation, use political advocacy to push for changes that make driving less viable, and maybe try to get density increased around existing stations, or you can go with the alternative, strike a defensive posture, start working a narrative that blames that loss on other entities, accuse them of being anti-union and privatizing infrastructure, argue for the need to bail out and support your service in perpetuity so you don't have to change and can keep operating as per usual. Who wants to fight with a union over automating lines when you can just stuff a stick in the wheels of a rim and pray that things will go back to the way they used to be? But that's not going to happen. That model is dying and making transit worse for people is not a solution to the problem. The trains will be fully automated and driverless. With four new automated metro lines. A computer is now driving this Thameslink train. On the nation's first driverless train network. The increasing rail capacity and efficiency. The political clash between the establishment transit agencies and the case got 2022 off to a rough start, but it set the tone for the year because 2022 was another election year in Quebec. And the REM, which had escaped being a political issue until that point, was shaping up to divide voters. The leaks from the transit agencies made it clear how things would break and what forces were at work to oppose the project behind the scenes. The establishment did not have the will to adopt the techniques the case was using. So instead of joining them, they were now going to fight them. The technocratic peace was over. Now things were political. Old school political.